The church is a place of hope, but hope should not be restricted to the walls of a building. It is our job as people of hope to give hope to a hopeless world. We should walk into every arena of our lives ready to share the hope that we have. We should trek into every encounter on a quest to display the image of Christ. And we should tread into every day looking for an excuse to point someone to Jesus. Often we hesitate, and regularly we don't feel like we have all the answers. But never forget that we have a mission to step out. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I want to take a moment this morning and just say thank you to Pastor Ben for uh, sharing about stepping out and telling others about Jesus last week. Come on, Pat, can we give Pastor Ben a hand? Thank you guys so much. We were on vacation last week uh, for spring break. Uh, Maddie, our oldest, who's at Baylor, she had a different spring break than the rest of the family. So I spent the last half of her spring break with her spending some time uh, before spending some time with Sasha and Kenzie on their spring break. And so Maddie and I did one of those... uh, what I would say bucket list uh, trips. You know what a bucket list is. It's, it's something you want to do before you kick the bucket, all right? And, uh, and so it was something that we've always wanted to do. We've wanted to go to Major League Baseball spring training in uh, Arizona. And so after looking at her schedule and, and uh, looking at the schedule for spring training, we realized that our two favorite teams are mine, the Reds and the Rangers, were playing Maddie's favorite team, the Dodgers, in consecutive days. And so we were like, hey, this is perfect timing. So we're going to get to go and hang out with them. So we scheduled the trip. We went out. We had a great time. But I want to tell you, why, while she and I were there, we kept talking about how we wish we could get Kenzie and Sasha and bring them back out to experience the same trip that we were experiencing. We were so excited about it. We were having a great experience, whether it was at a restaurant that we'd never tried before or an event that we hadn't gone to before. We wanted to share that experience with them. We wanted to share it with others. And I I don't know about you, but maybe you're like that. If you have a good experience, you're like, you want to take somebody else with you. When it's a new restaurant in town or it's a, it's a new place, that uh, some kind of event that, you're, that you've gone to or a concert, you want to take others along with you to share that experience. That works in general in life, but it also works as followers of Jesus Christ. We should all want others to experience what Jesus has done for us. Christian life, it's meant more to be just in this building on a Sunday or on a Wednesday night for community groups. Our God is not a Sunday-only God, amen? We, we who are Christians should allow Christ to affect every area of our life. So our purpose is our mission. If you go back to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, he says, I've given all authority in heaven and on earth Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, today we're going to bring a conclusion to this three-part series that we've called Stepping Out. And what we want us as a family of God at Hope Family Fellowship to do is to step out of our comfort zone, to step into the plan that God has for us, to look around us and see the harvest that's there, to step out and experience the miraculous in our life on a daily basis, to step out and really fulfill the purpose that God has for us. So we're, we're concluding this series with the idea that we're to step out and bring. We're to step out and we're to bring. We have a responsibility to go and tell. Pastor Ben talked about that last week. But we also see an alternative method in scripture of evangelism. It would be the come and see approach. In John chapter 4, we see the story of Jesus with a Samaritan woman at the well. And as Jesus and his disciples were returning to Galilee from Judea, they made their way through Samaria. They end up in a village called Sychar. And at that village, there's a well there. Jacob's well was actually there. And Jesus, he sits down by the well at noon. 
And he was by himself because the disciples had gone in to get some to the village to buy some food. And the Samaritan woman, she comes out to the well. And Jesus asked her, he says, hey, could you give me a drink? And the woman was surprised. She's like, hey, I can't believe you're asking me this because Jews and usually refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. And so she asked him why he was asking her for a drink. In John 4.10, Jesus says, If only you knew the gift God is for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So she's like, she's confused. She questions, how are you going to get this living water? And he says, anyone who drinks this water, verse 13, will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now this lady is intrigued by this time. She wants the living water that he has. So Jesus tells her, he says, why don't you go get your husband? And she says this, she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. (laughs) You don't have a husband, and for you have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And she's like, he just read her mail. I mean, have you ever had one of those moments where somebody just reads your mail? And you're like, uh, I didn't, you know, some of you may feel like that sometime when I'm preaching. But let, let me just say that's the Holy Spirit. It's not me. <laughs> she realizes there's something special about Jesus at this moment. And she calls him a prophet. Then she questions him as, about why Why do the Jews insist on worshiping at Jerusalem? And he gives her this answer, and we preached on this passage before where he talks about true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. And then in verse 25, the woman said, Well, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who is called Christ, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now, I think it's safe to say that this woman has had quite the encounter with Jesus. It's at this point of the story that the disciples show back up, and they're wondering what's happening. And they wanted to ask him why he was talking to this lady, why he was talking to the Samaritan woman, but they didn't have the nerve to ask him. So in John chapter 4, verse 28, it says, The woman left her water jar beside the well, And ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. The Samaritan woman, she has an encounter with Jesus. And the first thing she does is to run back to the village and say to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? She issues this invitation to come and see. See, the invitation to come and see, the first thing I want you to write down is this, is that it's an invitation to a location. The word translated as come actually means come here in the Greek. She's telling them to come here, to come to a location. She's inviting them to be where Jesus is at. It's the same thing that we see in the story of Matthew, that's also, who's also called Levi, when he was uh, converted and then he went and followed Jesus. In Luke chapter 5, verse 27, it says, Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up left everything and followed him. Verse 29, later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them, but the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered him. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. So here's what happens here is is Matthew or Levi has this encounter with Jesus, and he gives his life to him. He, He follows him, and what he does is he throws Jesus a party. 
where Jesus is the guest of honor. And so can you imagine that Jesus is there and he's got his disciples there. And then obviously there's some Pharisees there because they're complaining and mumbling and groaning about this. But then Levi says, hey, look, all my tax collector friends, all my friends over here that aren't living for God, that are doing things their own way, I want you to come to my house so you can hear about Jesus. It's an invitation to a location. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter Sunday. Inviting someone to hope that day is an invitation to a location. It's saying, I want you to come and see. I want you to come to here to Hope Family Fellowship. I want you to tune in to Hope Family Fellowship on that Sunday, and I want you to be a part of what God wants you to do that day. God has for you that day. The second thing is it's an invitation to experience. The word see in, in the original language that this was written in really had multiple meanings. It, it, had the, it, it means to see. It means to pay attention to. It means to understand. It means to visit. It means to experience. It means to learn about. I would imagine what the, the woman at the well really wanted is the people in her village, her family, her friends, those that were in her circle of influence, if you will, to experience Jesus the same way she had experienced. She said, could he, could he possibly be the Messiah? Could this be the Messiah? It's the same principle that we see in John 1 uh, when Philip was called to uh, be a disciple, and then, uh, and then all of a sudden Philip goes and looks for Nathaniel. In verse 45, and then told him, he said, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. He said, listen, I found the Messiah. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Verse 46, Nathaniel says this, he says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. What was he saying? He says, come and experience this yourself. As they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. (laughs) How do you know about me, Nathanael asked. And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. And then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Now, now, we don't know the location of, uh, of where that fig tree was. We, I, would, I would imagine for him to have that kind of reaction that the fig tree was uh, a distance away where Jesus just couldn't see with the, the naked eye there, to, if you will. But he, he, he saw him there, and he saw that Philip was going to him, and he probably even knew exactly what that conversation was going to be like. And so when he sees Nathaniel and he speaks those words, it was an experience for him to understand that God, that Jesus was who Philip said he was. Some people will follow Jesus because of your testimony. Some people are going to follow Jesus because you, you, you have this testimony and you tell them what God has done for you. But there are some people that need to experience it themselves. They, they need to go to the same place that you have. They need to have that, that experience. I, as, as a student pastor for 17 years, I thought if I could just get kids to youth camp, if I could just take a kid to camp and that can get them in the presence of God, something miraculous would happen. I want to tell you something, church. If we can just get them in the room and we have an ounce of anointing, then God can do more in a moment than we can ever do in a lifetime. That's why it's so important to invite people to a location to have them come and see, come and experience. Some people will need to have the experience that you've had. That's why it's important that we just don't have a go and tell strategy, but we have a come and see strategy as well. There are those in this church that you are here because somebody invited you. Somebody said, would you come and see what God is doing at Hope Family Fellowship? Would you come and experience? And you've invited others who now sit in this room because they have come and they have seen. What if we just all did it one more time? Easter is coming up, and we want them to experience Jesus just like we have. John chapter 4, verse 31, if you're still with me, say amen. If you're still asleep, say amen. 
Verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Verse 33, did someone bring you food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. And then Jesus explained, he said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between harvesting, planting and harvesting, but I say wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant, and others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. I think as, as I was studying this again, and, and I preached on John chapter 4, I've done a whole series on, 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 this, uh, on this passage. I think there were five, four or five messages in there. So um, to, to come today and just focus on this idea of coming and seeing um, to me is, is an interesting thing. And, but I haven't preached it like this before because there's a comparison here that I had never really saw. The Samaritan woman was an outcast. She wasn't one of the disciples. She wasn't a person that the disciples thought should be hanging around Jesus. Yet, this outcast is the one that was doing the work of an evangelist. She's the one that went back into town and, and told others, hey, you need to come and see what God is doing you need could this possibly be the messiah she began to invite people to come see and experience jesus just like she had so i thought about this for a moment and i realized that the disciples were being exclusive they were trying to pick and choose whom jesus could be around but this woman was including everybody she was saying could you all come? Everybody come and see. Come and see a man that's told me everything that I've ever done. The disciples, they were like, we're in Samaria. We're, we're being reluctant to share the faith. But this woman was willingly sharing what God had done for her. The disciples were concerned about the natural. Jesus, why don't you get something to eat here? We, we want to feed you. We want to, we want to take care of your natural needs. But this woman was invested in what God was doing supernaturally in her life. The disciples, their, their heart was right in a good place. They were serving Jesus. They were trying to feed and take care of their rabbi, take care of their master, if you will, take care of, of Jesus, their friend. They had a good heart with good intentions, but this woman was not focused on just serving Jesus. She was focused on speaking about Jesus. So Jesus uses this, this to teach the disciples about reaching the lost. He said, listen, my nourishment comes from doing the will who, him who sent me. Listen, we can and we should serve. Amen? We can serve the church, the body of Christ, using our gifts, but if we are involved in reaching the lost around us, then church, we truly have missed the mark on the purpose and the mission of Christ. So there's some lessons that Jesus taught his disciples that I think are appropriate for us today. And lesson number one is this, focus on what's important to God. Verse 32, Jesus says, they'd ask him to eat something, and he says, I have a food kind of food you don't know nothing about. The disciples were concerned about serving Jesus. They wanted him to eat, but his focus was on the lost. His focus was on the, those that were away from God. And he responds, he says, I've got a food, kind of food you know nothing about. He, he was saying, what keeps me going is sticking to the things that truly matter. Every soul matters to God. Every person matters to God. There is not a single solitary individual in Hopkins County that doesn't matter to the Father. He sent his son to die for every single person. And if every soul matters to God, then every soul should matter to us. 
ministering to and reaching people is more important than anything that we can do. Now listen, I, I know there's a lot of things, and we've got great people that, that serve in a variety of areas, and every Sunday it takes anywhere from 17 to 20. 223 people to make this thing happen between people who are serving in nursery on our tech team our worship team our hospitality team all those things matter but listen we can't just do that and not do the work of evangelism not go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in it's more important than our personal agendas it's more important than our work and our hobbies it's more important than being inconvenienced and as we see here it's more important than food are we willing to deal with some hunger a little longer if it means that we invite someone to come and see what God is doing in our life? 2 Timothy 2.4 uh, in the ESV says like this, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What is Paul saying here? He's saying for a soldier, civilian pursuits are not the most important thing. What is important for a soldier is following the orders of his commander. Our aim should be to please the Father. What pleases the Father is for us to look for what matters to him. Lesson number two, we need to focus on the mission. They're like, did somebody bring him food? And he says, my nourishment is due to the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You would think that the disciples had been around Jesus enough to know that he was going to teach them by using some sort of analogy or parable or story or metaphor or simile or something. He was going to use some kind of illustration. And when he said, I have food you know nothing about, they could clearly see that he didn't have any kind of food in his hand. You would think that their minds would immediately at that point shift from the natural to the supernatural. They didn't get it. And, and immediately thought somebody else must have brought him food. Then he explains to them what keeps me going. His nourishment is from doing the will of God and finishing his work. Church, we have a responsibility to reach the loss. The lesson here is that we have to focus on our mission. And this is not just a, a, a Sunday thing. It's not just a Wednesday thing. It's not just an Easter thing. But it's a, something that should compel us because 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonder, wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. God is giving the message and he's given us the mission to be his ambassadors. Lesson number three, write this down. We need to focus on the harvest. He says, you know the saying. Four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around you. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Now maybe... Your translation uses the word, the, the fields are white to harvest. These are some strong words here for Jesus. He said, listen, I want you to wake up. Wake up. Look around you. It's believed that what Jesus was doing is because if you remember, the lady went in, she said, come and see. And then the scripture said that the people began to stream. Now, they're, they're outside the village a little ways, okay? So it's not like there's a group of people over here, and she's saying, hey, come here, and there, there's time that's taken. They're not jumping in a minivan. They're not getting in their car. They're, they're not taking a little scooter, you know, down the road. They're, they're walking to the well where Jesus is at. So this took some time. This, this exchange here wasn't just happening like it does in scripture, we read it and we think, man, bang, 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 it happened like that. No, it, it took some time. And so as Jesus is saying, he's saying, wake up, look around you, the fields are white to harvest. It is believed that Jesus was saying that, not because in, 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 in Samaria that when a harvest came, they, it wasn't white, 
when they would see whatever was growing, whatever they were harvesting, there wasn't anything white there about the harvest. But the Samaritans were known to wear white. So when he said the fields are white to harvest, he was pointing to the Samaritans and he was saying, listen, this is the people that you need to focus on. They're lost. They, they need a relationship with Jesus. They need a, a relationship with the Messiah. They need to have that experience. And you guys are focusing right here on food and on, on, on this stuff. But look around you, friends. The harvest is coming right here to us. Church, my, my question for us today is who needs Jesus in your life? Look around this week. Don't just see the people that you normally see. You know, I, I, this week I had an interaction with a guy that, that I have had an interaction with several times. And just me having this as an awareness, I pulled out one of these and said, hey, would you be my guest on Easter Sunday? Would you come and see? There's something about when we have an awareness of, the, of, the, of people that may be lost or people that we don't know their spiritual condition, that we put our focus on that, that we begin to see the opportunities. So look around you. Who needs Jesus? Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, and this is what I want you to see this morning, when he saw the crowds of people, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And he turned to his disciples and he said this, he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. We don't have a harvest problem in the church. We have a worker problem. The harvest is there. Oh, pastor, we live in the Bible Belt. Everybody's heard about Jesus. Oh, if I could just put you all in a bus and drive you around right now in the middle of, of church and to see how many people in this town that are out mowing their lawn or already sitting at a local restaurant having brunch or getting their golf clubs ready to go golfing or, or got their boat and pulling it out to Lake Fork so that they can go fishing. I, I, I wish I could take you this morning so that you would understand that the majority of our community is probably not sitting in a local church today. The harvest is great, but we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to take, well, they're going to think I'm weird. Well, they probably already think you're weird. <laughs> you know, if, if you're different than people, they think you're weird, and you think they're weird. And guess what? All God's children are weird. It's all right. Y'all probably think I'm weird. It's okay. I think some of you are. <laughs> I love you anyway, and I hope you love me anyway. The reality is this, there are people out there that need the message of hope, and we have it. We have it. We have it. We have the best thing that has ever happened to this world. We have it. And God has said, listen, the harvest is great, but their workers are few. So I'm asking you to pray that God send more workers. But don't use that scripture as an excuse for not being involved in harvesting yourself. All it takes is an invitation to somebody to come and see. Lesson number four. We got to focus on the process, not the results. I don't know about you, but I love, I love getting to finish something. I, I love when I share about Jesus and somebody just like, oh, yes, and they start crying, they start weeping, and they give their heart to the Lord, and you kind of got a little spiritual notch on your belt. Yeah, got, got another one saved. Praise God. But our responsibility is not the results. 
It's the process. Verse 36, Jesus said, The harvesters are are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to worship where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Donald Stamps writes this. He says, those who introduce others to Jesus and lead them to a point of accepting Christ and yielding their lives to him are doing something of eternal significance. They will one day rejoice in heaven over those who were saved because of their prayers, their example, and their witness. At the same time, they must remain humble, never lose sight of the fact that any success they see in the service for Jesus is a result of the sacrificial work of Christ and the prayers and the spiritual seed planting of others. In the same way, we will seldom see or experience the full result of our spiritual labors because other faithful Christians will come behind us and reap a spiritual harvest where we have previously planted and invested in lives, but whether we plant the spiritual seeds of love and kindness that later cause someone to turn to God or whether we pray for someone to actually receive Christ, we are all part of the same process. There should be no competition among God's people. And when individuals come to Jesus, it is a reason for all Christians to rejoice. We're not responsible for the outcome. We're not responsible for the outcome. We are only responsible for our part of the process. We're responsible to go and tell. We're responsible to invite people to come and see. Sometimes we're going to plant, and sometimes we're going to water, and sometimes there are going to be occasions where we get to harvest. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, uh, Paul said this. He said, I planted the seed in your heart. Apollos watered it, but it was God who ultimately made it grow. It's not important who does the planting. It's not important who does the watering. What is important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters works together for the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their own hard work. You may have been sitting there telling somebody about everything that Jesus has done in your life. You may have been going and telling and, and, and telling them and telling them and telling them. And you're going to give them a card and say, come and see. Come and experience God for yourself. And they're going to come here on a Sunday morning, and I'm going to preach a message that day, and I'm going to talk about uh, John 3.16, how God so loved the world and gave his only son for them, and I'm going to give them the Romans road to salvation, and they're going to raise their hand, and you're going to go, man, Pastor Rusty got to lead them to Jesus. That's not fair. Come on. I've had that thought before. When I've been on that other side of planting and watering and then somebody else or all of a sudden somebody that I've been investing in and in, 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 in the community and, and working on and working on and all of a sudden they get an invitation and they go with their mom or something to another church in town and then I see that they gave their heart to the Lord and I'm like, man, I get frustrated about that. So I know if I get frustrated about it, you do. But guess what? We're all part of the same kingdom. We're all part of the same Family, I'm going to get to spend eternity in heaven with people that I've invested in that I've never led to the Lord. Some seeds that I've planted, some seeds that I've watered. I can't tell you how many times as a, as a pastor now, as a leader years after I've been a, a student pastor, that I'll, I'll see a student somewhere and they'll say, hey, something that you said to me way back then in one of your messages impacted me. I wasn't ready to receive Christ yet, but now I'm serving Jesus. I had that happen in a general council. I'm walking the floor of a general council, and this young man stops me, and he says, oh, Pastor Rusty, this is Pastor Rusty. Guys, and he had like three or four like people that he was mentoring around him and saying, guys, this is Pastor Rusty. He was the one who first invested in me. I wasn't ready to receive Christ yet, but it was after that, after that experience, he was the one who, t- who spoke this into my life, and, and the word that I'd spoken into his life, I mean, I'm talking 25 years ago. This is my first youth ministry. I was 22, 23 years old at that time. So it was a little bit more than 25 years ago. 
and, and, and I spoke something, but it was meaningful to him. And now he's training up a new generation of evangelists. But it, it was something that I planted a seed in his life. I never got to see that seed grow until years later I'm in the general council. And he's saying, hey, listen, man of God, would you pray for me right now? So we stopped right there among all the uh, vendors and different things that's right, right there in the vendor hall. And I just laid my hands on him and began to pray for him and began to get pray for his people. Why? Because it was something that was meaningful to him years before. We're part of a process, so we can't get frustrated. The Samaritan woman planted a seed, but it was Jesus who ultimately gave them the experience that they needed. She watered it with an invitation to come and see, but God was the one who made it grow. So what happened? John 4, 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. God, I, I thank you, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Maybe you're here in this room this morning, church, with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Romans 3.23 tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says... The wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says he gave his son. God gave his son. It's a gift to this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're in this room this morning you don't know Jesus, or maybe you've been away from God and you need to make a rededication or you're watching online this morning in a moment I'm going to count to three and I want you to respond to God if you're in this room today I want you to respond by raising your hand and we're going to pray a prayer together if you're online today would you respond by sending an email to prayer at hopefamily.tv or put a comment in the comment section today that you're responding to God and in a moment we're all going to pray a prayer together and I believe if you'll pray that prayer and you'll meet it in your heart, that you'll be saved. But I want to know who I'm praying with today. If that's you and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to rededicate myself to him. Or maybe you're here and you need to dedicate yourself to him for the first time. If that's you, when I say three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Yes. Anybody else in this room today saying, I'm ready? Come on, church, would you pray this prayer for me? Would you say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died, rose again, and you're the Lord of all. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ushers are going to come right now, and they're going to they're gonna give you a packet of these Easter invites. Some of you took a packet last week and 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 uh, go ahead and begin to pass them out to everybody in this room and uh, I want you to take one you put put one on your car put one in your put one in your um, purse ladies if you carry that around men if you've if you've got a backpack or something put put them around so that you can have this but I want everybody today to to get one of these in your hand go ahead begin to pass those out today guys thank y'all for doing that and this is what we're going to do in a moment we're going to pray and I'm going to ask that the Lord speak to you about people who you need to invite but the second thing I'm going to ask you and I want to challenge you this on this morning as they're passing it out is one of the ways that we can come and see in today's society is by hitting the like and the share button on Facebook Pastor Ben has, has got an event page uh, for our Easter service and, and you can just go and you can share that out. I saw some of you have already done that today as, as he's put, put that out. Go and just share that. Invite, and then there's a button on there that you can go and invite your friends. And so just go down the list and begin to invite 
friends, people that you want to be here. And then later when you see them, you can hand them a card and say, will you come? There, the, in advertising, there's, there's several ways that, that they get you. I don't know if you have this experience, but, you know, if I just think about something, all of a sudden it, it, it comes on my, on my Facebook feed. I may not even say anything, but if I just think about something, all of a sudden I start getting a lot of information about that. You know, we were in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, Maddie and I were, and then Sasha and Kenzie and I, we, we spent a couple of days in San Antonio. And it's amazing all the things from Phoenix and San Antonio that are now on my fa Facebook feed. I'm like, if y'all only know, I'm not going back there for a long, long time. Well, maybe San Antonio, but not, not definitely not Phoenix. Uh, it'll be a little bit, because that, that's a long drive or a long flight. And I'm just going to tell y'all, getting up at 445 that time and losing two hours coming back is, is for the birds. But I digress. Uh, I'm definitely not going in the summer because it's too hot for, for a fat man. I'm just telling y'all that right now. So that being said, there's ways to get this out there, and we're, we want to get the message out. And sometimes people are like, well, I, yeah, I think I've seen that before. I've seen that before. Well, if they've seen it on social media and then you invite, it's just double the power. So I want to challenge you to help, help us out, but also to be a part of the mission of Christ by doing that, inviting people to come and see. Everybody got one of these? Would you hold it in your hand this morning? There we go. And I want to pray for you today. Those of you that are online today, if you, if, if you, if we got people that watch this regularly from other cities, use that event page to invite your friends to, to tune in on Easter Sunday. Those of you that are in this room and maybe you're, uh, you know of somebody who lives in another community that doesn't have a church home, you can invite them to tune in that day as well. But there are people in this town that is our Jerusalem harvest, are the people that we could look around and Jesus would say, look, the harvest is ripe, it's ready, it just needs workers. And we are the workers. We're who God has commissioned to be his hands and feet in this community. So I want you to hold this in your hand today, and I want to pray. And I want to pray that God would give you the people that you need to invite. And he would give you divine appointments this week. Father, I thank you, Lord, that there is a, a day on the calendar like Easter that, that has, while it's, Genesis is in the church. Um, those that are in the world understand a little bit about what it's about. And they know it's a time, many know it's a time where you go to church on that day. It's just a, a cultural thing. But God, I, I, I'm not asking for a large crowd that day just so that we could put a number on a piece of paper and say that we had it. But I'm asking for the harvest. There are people in this room that have planted and watered seeds. They've gone and they've told. They've shared the message of hope. But now, God, they need to have the courage and the boldness to invite someone to come and see. And I pray, God, that you would give us the people and that you would give us the divine appointments. Would you put people in our path? Would you help us to keep these invite cards handy? God, would you use us? God, would you cause our social media feeds to go viral? God, And just so that people might get a glimpse of it and then have a reinforcement by somebody inviting them personally. I pray, God, that they would come and experience Jesus. I pray, Lord, that the next few weeks would be amazing, that there would be people, people that would receive Jesus even before Easter Sunday, that just an invitation card would spark a conversation that would lead to a salvation. God, I pray that there would be people that tune in for the first time on Easter Sunday 
that have never tuned into our service before. I pray, God, that you would use us. Use us to be your workers, to be your hands and feet in every place that we go. In the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. Church, this Saturday, we're going to be at Journey Road. Um, foster families from all over our region are coming there. And this is how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. So some of you have never gone with us to Journey Road. I, 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 I want to challenge you. There's a map, connectedhope.com. It's active that you can just click on that, on that and it will give you a map to Journey Road. You can meet us there at 11. From 11 to noon, we set up. We get ready from noon to 2. We'll have the egg hunt. They always have food, and it's good. So they feed us uh, hamburgers and hot dogs sometimes, I think, is what we've had before. It depends on the time of the day. We've had breakfast stuff. And, and so you'll be fed. You'll get to hang out. You'll get to meet people. You'll get to hear their stories. And I'm telling you, at least once, I always shed some sort of tear because uh, of what, what's happening. So this next Saturday, I encourage you to come and be a part of it. If you never, if you never have, uh, listen. If you if you can help us, there, the more hands, the better. Our wins, our Winsboro location, our sister church, a Hope Family Fellowship in Winsboro, they're going to be there with us as well, working this event. It's just going to be a good time, and I encourage you to come and be a part of it. Um, I'm going to pray over you today. Next Sunday, I'm I'm going to be speaking. You know. Uh, on, on Palm Sunday, challenges us on that. And Easter Sunday, I've got a, a standalone message as well for that that I'm excited to be able to share with you uh, this this week. I mean, we're coming good times. It's exciting, exciting times. Bring somebody. If you see somebody who hasn't been here in a few weeks, reach out to them. Let's, let's be the body of Christ together. Amen? Let me pray for you today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church family. God, I pray for your blessings upon them today. God, I pray that you would bless them and keep them, that you would make your face shine down upon them and be gracious to them, and that you would give them peace. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. God bless you, church.